Hey, welcome to Bifocal. We have a show today that uh, is going to be a little bit unique from what we've done in the past. We're going to be talking about HR and uh, perhaps how the role of HR may need to be changing as we move forward. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. We have, uh, we have a guest on today. We have an HR specialist uh, on today. An HR professional has been in the industry for years, and we're going to talk about all kinds of different aspects of HR today. But uh, really where we're going to spend some time is the role of HR, and, and specifically uh, in today's environment, but more importantly, where HR maybe needs to go in the future. So we have uh, Mark White, Director of Benefit Account Operations, from GMS, uh, Group Management Services here, to kind of uh, share a little bit about his background, but more importantly, some things that he thinks HR needs to be thinking about moving forward. So Mark, uh, welcome to Bifocal. Thanks, Dan, appreciate you having me. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're somewhat local. I am. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 and uh, and uh, GMS Group Management Service is not too far from here. Yeah, maybe fifteen minutes. Yeah, and it's been a while since I have seen you. You and I go way back, way back. But yes. this is probably the first I've seen you in I I don't even know how it's long. It's been more than twenty years, I'm sure. I I think it's been more than twenty years. Yeah. But I think when I did uh, first met you, you were in HR. That's correct. You were in HR, and and uh, I can remember going to you with questions, and uh, but it has been at least twenty years. Yep. Yeah, well, good good to see you, and thanks well. for taking the time. So thanks you're you're me. working for uh, GMS. Tell me a little bit about so GMS. So uh, GMS, Group Management Services, is a professional employer organization. Essentially, we provide outsourced payroll services, HR services, benefit, risk management, companies across the United States, servicing about 30,000 employees uh, wow. throughout, the, throughout the U.S., any particular industry that you focus in or does it no, matter? No, really cover all industries from, you know, manufacturing to trucking to services. Tends to be organizations that are a little smaller, maybe 200 or fewer employees. Okay. On, That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. There's a certain demographic. Yeah, typically. Yeah. Okay. All across the country. All across the country. Very good. Now, prior to GMS, you, as I mentioned earlier, you've been in the HR uh, field for a while. I've been in the HR field for, geez, over 30 years. Did you start your career there? No, you know, it's interesting. I started as, um, I started as an accountant. So I graduated uh, with a degree in accounting. I spent my first five years in financial reporting roles, accounting roles. And then I was selected to participate in a management development program at a publicly traded firm. I rotated for a couple of years through every department. And the last one I ended up in was human resources. And in you fact, never that, left. I have never left. In fact, that was so long ago, it was called personnel then. It wasn't even human resources. So it was the personnel department. <laughs> you're you're I didn't, dating I, yourself. And I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> and um, so I, 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 yeah. uh, that's where I kind of cut my teeth. You, you just found interest there? Or? You know what? It literally on day one of that rotation, I remember coming home and saying, I found where I want to be. Really? Literally knew it on day one, 30 years later, maybe longer than that. You know, the passion's still you there. You made a good choice. And yeah, it was, it was a great move. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a good. great move. Yeah. Interesting. I, I did not know that. Yeah. Did not know that about you. So if I look at now the HR function, to kind of give you a little perspective, you know, in background, you know, I started on the financial side and then I moved into this rotation, ended up in HR. Then from there, I just worked with a number of HR roles, including when I think about where the great experience came from, I was the vice president of HR for a large uh, multi-billion dollar company, national company, 30,000 employees, where I ran the HR group from literally from Maine to Alaska. Um, and then more recently was the chief HR officer and senior vice president of shared services for a national <clears throat> financial services company. We had about 125 locations. And not only I ran HR there, but I also had technology accounting and facilities as well. 
So you get some large scale HR exposure. Large scale, yeah. Large large companies, a lot of employees, and um, really been exposed to about everything you can imagine in the HR. And then I also ran an HR consulting practice for years, which I still have. And this is on the side. It's on the side now, uh, but I I started this practice back in '98. Joined a regional accounting firm. I guess I couldn't get away from those accounting roots. I ended up becoming the CEO, managing partner of the accounting firm, but still ran the consulting practice. So I spent about 10 years doing that. So I work with clients from small privately held companies to large international companies, including, you know, I had um, folks like Federal Reserve Bank was a client of mine, but I had small five, six, 10, 15 employee organizations, the clients. So really the full scope of of HR from big to small. So you've been around, you've been around the block. Long time. Well, you know, and that's why I wanted to have you on. Um, I spend a lot of time in the sales and marketing arena and and that type of thing. And and most of my shows and most of my conversations and day to day kind of center around, you know, that those topics. And even in, even in light of everything going on with COVID, most of my conversations with people have been around the IT demands that have changed with remote workforces, been around sales, how, how am I changing my sales strategy now? And I got remote sales reps. And, but I haven't spent a lot of time and I haven't been part of a lot of conversations around HR and the challenges and demands that have put on been placed on HR because of this. And so maybe you can share some insight, you know, from work at GMS, what you're running into with companies and, and just your, your knowledge base. But what are some of those challenges that HR is going through now? Well, you know, one of the one of the first things that kind of happened with this, this just came on so abruptly. And if probably with, with your company, you know, what we saw is that companies decided to, well, it looks like we need to shut down for most were two weeks or three weeks, or that's what they thought. Yeah. So here we are. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because we said probably going to need to do this for a good three or four weeks. Exactly. Exactly. And so think about employees were sent home with the idea, I'm going to be back in two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. I mean, even small things, people left their plants and personal things in the office, and those are all dead now. Uh, but, um, uh, but we weren't prepared for this long term being away from the workforce. So some of the early challenges that we were seeing happen, and you talked about technology, you know, was the really did, did these employees have the technology to effectively work remotely? Uh, a lot of them didn't bring their monitors home. They didn't have the right internet connections. And suddenly what this did is it forced HR to really rethink how we're going to support a remote workforce so they can remain highly productive and do the things that we kind of expected them to do. And we weren't ready for that. And it was one of these things, okay, we're kind of learning as we go. Uh, literally with us, you know, we had call center folks and we had others that needed to have more commercial grade internet connections and to some things that they just did not have yep. that, you know, we had to get involved. Okay, how are we going to get these put into their homes or what kind of environment can we give them where they can, you know, work more effectively? Did you have the ability to even track what was going on? A lot of companies, you know, didn't have a good HR system in place necessarily for hourly workers to track their time, you know, in and out. We had to consider things like, okay, you're working from home. You still have issues with workers comp. What happens if somebody gets hurt at home? How does that work? Well, you know, actually it's an extension of the office. And, and so it's really no different than, you know, if they were sitting in the office doing something. Because they're considering working, they're on the clock. Exactly. And they're on the clock. They're representing the so company. So an employee falls down the steps at their home during the working hours. It's, it it's could a be potentially company. a worker's comp claim, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of factors that we need to be considered, but you just have to think about those things. Yep. We have to think about, you know, things like the ergonomics as well. Do they have an environment to work from at home that where they can be productive and to do their jobs. 
the other things were, you know, where we kind of struggled early on was this whole kind of that social connection, that lack of social interaction. Yeah. You know, because people like that. But let me, I'm going to back up on it. Some you mentioned yeah. about, you mentioned about, we have to think about the ergonomic side of it and are they set up to work from home? I'm going to go extreme with you. Right. Let's assume somebody didn't. All right. What responsibilities on the employer? Can the employer say, well, hey, I'm, I'm sorry if you can't get set up at home, then you can't do the job. What, 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 what's the liability and what's the responsibility on an employer? Right. You know, that's, that's a great question, Dan. There's really not, there's more of a, let's say of a moral, moral obligations doing the right thing from a okay. legal perspective. You know, if this individual does not have the setup to work at home, the company does not have a legal obligation company's not responsible for putting internet in no. and making sure they have the right speed internet. Exactly. No, that's okay. the, that is the employee's responsibility. Now, suddenly though, when you have all these folks at home and you have a job to get done, yeah. I think a lot of employers realize, they, they you know chip what, in somewhere. I better do this. Yeah, exactly. I better do this. Otherwise, okay. you know, I've got a workforce that can't do their job. So there's not an obligation to do it from a legal perspective, but there certainly is an obligation that if you expect and you're going to hold people to the same performance standards, you need to do some things to help them, yeah. you know, be able to, to. But if an employee says, I, geez, I'm not as productive because I'm at home now and I don't have this or I don't have that, or my kids are, you know, crying in the background, that's kind of their responsibility. It's their responsibility. It's their responsibility. Now, as an employer, as an HR professional, when we see those type of situations, really what I look at is what sort of flexibility can we provide? Can we allow that employee to work off hours? So I've got kids at home. I have a spouse at home. And suddenly, you think about it, even if you have the right technology, now you have all this demand yeah. on your system. You have your spouse working from home. You have kids doing online school. Yep. And now we're just like, well, just it's just yeah. putting in a or you're, capacity. You're putting though. movies in because you want to keep them occupied. It, it, so now exactly they're streaming right. stuff. Right? Exactly right. Just yesterday, one of my managers, you know, we're in the midst of a team meeting, conference call, Zoom call. We use Skype. You know, everyone's online, and next thing you know, her daughter is in the picture, and she's got these big tears coming down her face because she couldn't figure out a school assignment. This is when my manager was giving her presentation. Yeah. And suddenly yep. she has to disappear. And so I think employers and HR professionals just have to understand this is the environment we're living in and we need to be flexible There's and allow big, those yeah. folks to. Got to be a little some flexibility going it, on here. It, exactly. Exactly. I mean, you can take the hardcore line and say, you're going to adhere to these things. You're going to work these hours. You're going to do it. And some jobs demand that. Where that job has that flexibility, that's where we really yeah. need to. Well, you on. started down this path talking about um, from an HR standpoint and from a company standpoint that we were we were required to deploy people home pretty quick, right? And there was this probably um, implication that it's going to be short term, right. right? And and so you know that was a good point, but it wasn't. It isn't. So what are you seeing from an HR perspective? What's HR groups doing now under, you know, with a different understanding of what the economy is and what the market is and what the climate is and what reality is? What are they doing now? Well, what, what we're seeing now, there's multiple things. One, a lot of companies still want to get folks back in the office. Do or don't? They do. Employers do. Not all. But a lot of them do. And I think they're asking the wrong questions. They're talking about- Why do you think they do? Well, you know, a lot of them have this office space that they're paying lease and rent. Um, there's still, there's still today a trust issue with a lot of, particularly old school. That? I'm still seeing that. I'm still seeing that even though all the data is showing us employees are more engaged Productivity level is the same or higher than it was pre-COVID. When you say you're seeing that and there's this, like, what are the things you're hearing or seeing that's making you say that? I am hearing from business owners, you know, particularly on the consulting side, or even with our own company. Are my employees really working at home? I can't see them 
I don't know what they're really doing. And let's face it, a lot of companies don't have the greatest measures and metrics in place to necessarily measure that productivity. And so I think they're working, or some of them I've heard say, I'm convinced they're not. But if they're sitting out here, I'm... I'm convinced they are. Exactly. Exactly. You know, in the, in the funny thing. We all thing, know they're, they're no more, they're just here. Exactly. And, you know, I look at that and say, you know what? Good employees are good employees if they're working at home or if they're working in the office. Yep. And, 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 and bad employees. And bad employees are, are bad. bad employees. Yep. And it doesn't change a thing. No. They changed their seat. They didn't change their character, their work ethic, their ability. Nothing has changed. Yeah. And... But this idea that I can see them and yep. it's like, okay, I know they're here working. So you're actually seeing companies that want to bring people back. They want to bring people back. They want to bring people back. Interesting, employees aren't that, that excited about coming back. Just just yesterday, Gallup released a large survey that talked about the kind of the sentiment towards employees coming back. More than a third of respondents said, I never want to step foot in the office again. More than a third. Now, are these all employee levels? Employee? All employee levels, from manager levels to okay. hourly workers. Okay. 72% said, I want to rem- work remote at least, if not full-time, part-time. And you know what? There's a real divergence from a gender perspective as well. The female workers were... At a much higher percentage, 48% said they really not do not want to come back into the office, that they want to remain working at home. So overall, just about 30%, but 48% of the female workforce indicated they would like to continue to work and permanently. The males, I'm assuming, were a little different. That's exactly right. The males were different. You know, they were... And get me out of the house. Get me out of the house. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's, that's, you know, so it's kind of interesting. But now, you know, we're seeing so many more uh, females in the workforce that, that, you know, are making up a large percentage of critical jobs in the workforce. Uh, and so I think we really need to, as employers, to pay attention because the expectation pre-COVID is, gosh, I maybe sometime would like to work from home. That has changed. What we're seeing now is employees expect, absolutely expect to have that option going forward. It, it's no longer, gosh, it would be nice. Well, and, and it's going to be tough now for employers because if they're not offering that and the majority of the market is, it's going to be tough to retain employees. So they may be forced into some decisions that maybe they really don't want to. Yeah, that's a great point. They either, you know, Dan, though, what's interesting about that is the timing. The folks in the, in the companies that will, will be more flexible, more agile, will adopt these type of practices early on are going to win. They're going to be able to retain the employees. The ones that aren't are going to start losing them. And we're yeah. seeing that already, that they're saying, hey, you need to get back into the office. In the meantime, these folks are being recruited away from other companies. Say, hey, come and work with us. Yeah. You never have to work in the office. Yeah. You can work from home. I don't care right. where you I live. I think your point of, of the flexible companies, the companies that are willing to adapt, though they're going to be the ones to succeed. And, and I think the way I look at that is when you start out a business, I think you have some maybe preconceived notions that I'm just going to do it this way. Okay. Well, you end up finding after you're in business, this way may not work. Being in business is running a business based on what the business needs, requires to be a business. Whether it's really exactly the way you want it, you have to accommodate certain things to have a viable business. And I think some companies, many companies, and you probably attest to this more than I can, is that progression, some companies are moving down that path real quick. They're just adapting and moving and they're flexible and others are a little bit more stick in the mud. I'm yeah, sure you're sure. seeing some of that. Yeah, very much. Uh, there is a real divergence between what organizations are doing and some are moving quickly and others are just set their ways. Yeah. So, Darn it. Let's we're just gonna, get back the we're way we were. Get back the way we were. We want to get back to normal. Yeah. 
and there's no more normal. So what what do companies need to do in entertaining this idea? Because you know we're going to have vaccines coming out, right? And we're going to get back to a exactly. little bit more flat line here. And all the employees are going to be faced with a decision. So what do you? What are those considerations? Well, we have a lot of considerations. I think the first thing we need to do, particularly now, because we're seeing a lot of companies bringing employees back, whether it's kind of a hybrid workforce, you know, part time, they're rotating shifts, whatever they're doing. You know, the first thing that has to happen is let's look at the kind of the health and safety of the employees. Employees now expect their employer to make that a priority. And it's something we really didn't think about before. And now employees are saying, that needs to be a priority of my employer to make sure that I am in fact- And there's an expense with that from an employer standpoint. There's a huge expense, a huge expense. So let's just think about some of the measures that have to happen. So even let's let's talk about the day you walk into the office, you're coming back into the office. Uh, a lot of people have touch pads on their doors to get in, you know, ways to get into that. Companies need to find ways to have more of an automatic touchless type of environment to where people are not handling surfaces where others are touching. So before you even walk in the building, there's considerations and there's costs that we need to think about. Like, well, you know what? We can't have 200 employees typing in their, you know, their security code to get into this building because now we have that. I talked to an owner who put automatic door openers yes. on all his, his, his entrance ways. Yeah, exactly. So people didn't have to grab the handles. That's exactly right. And I, and I think the individual shared with me, it was like fifteen or $20,000 to right. equip his building. Exactly right. Now let's think, you know, let's look at we're in a high rise. And we've got elevators. And basically the protocol is you shouldn't have more than one or two people in an elevator at a time. So just from a logistic perspective, getting people up to their workplace is a challenge. You know, I never even thought about it because I'm in a, I'm, I've yeah. always been in a one. You're right. These yeah. downtown offices got people going up and down. Exactly. And, and you can't put 15, 20 people in an elevator. And so now you've got that logistic to think about. You have temperature testing. You have all the different things. How do you, you look at, you go into a supermarket now and you've got all the little, you know, tape on the floor, one way aisles, yeah. you have, you know, let's keep six feet apart, you know, all these things. If you're going down the same aisle as somebody else, man, it's like both stop. Like, exactly. Okay, who's going to make a move here? Exactly. But think about it, your office space is no different. <clears throat> and so you have to reconfigure the office space. You maybe now that we use every other cube or every third cube. What's an employer supposed to do? Okay, I'm an employer, right? I have a lot of common areas. I have the coffee pot areas. I have toasters and microwaves. People put their bagels in the morning. They get coffee. Everyone's grabbing the same coffee pot. You have the bathroom situations, right? So what are things employers got to go through? So, you know, what they have to go through, For a lot of them have shut down these common areas, or they say one person at a time. They've put up, you know, you have uh, wipes, sprays, and what have you. So I go in, I use the coffee pot, I have to wipe it down, the next person's allowed so to come in. So why does an employee want to come back to work in that environment when they're at their home and exactly. they're comfortable? You know, and that, well, you know, it's not only that. Employers say, well, let's get them in because we like the social interaction and what have you. But the fact is, that's not there anyway. Because one at a time in a break room, conference rooms, you really need to limit conference room just to one person using it, you know, and they, you, you can't have that conference room with 15, 20 people collaborating in there. And so even when you're in the office, we're seeing companies that are, you're still doing your meetings via Zoom or Skype. It's like, well, yeah. why do I drive into the office for that? But let's take this a step further where I'm getting a lot of questions comes to things like HIPAA, American with Disabilities Act. And COVID has changed a lot of that, what an employer can and can't do and what information they can share and can't share. So let's say, for example, you know, from an employer, I'll, I'll get asked all the time, can I require an employee to get a test for COVID? The answer is yes. 
You can. You can. You can. You can absolutely require it. Do I? Do I need any particular data? Is it if just I suspicion? Think they, if I think they've been exposed, if they're showing symptoms of of being sick, that's subjective. I could say, yeah, it's subjective. But you know, think about it. It's not much different than we've always had reasonable cause drug testing. Right. So if you're in an organization and I have reasonable cause, I think someone might be intoxicated around drugs. I could send that person for a for a drug test. And if they refuse, you could terminate. Now, again, what's the right thing to do? Do you really want to do that or do you just want to send them home and quarantine them, you know, for 14 days or 21 days? But let's look at contract tracing. We've got somebody who is now tested positive. You can ask an employee for a to to basically do a voluntary disclosure that will allow the company to disclose to others who might have been exposed yeah. to let them know that they were here's in a the meeting situation. With them you were in a meeting with so and so, and they have tested positive for COVID. That's that's permissible to do. If that employee refuses, said I'm not going to voluntarily allow this to be disclosed. So what happens then? You have reasonable, the employer has to have some sort of, uh, take reasonable measures to protect the confidentiality of that employee. Not sharing their name. puts the employer in a... In a really bad situation. The flip side of that, the employer also has an obligation to if they know that this person, others have been exposed, they need to let those individuals know. All right, know. I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. Because you're, you're on a very interesting topic here, okay? I'm going to reiterate what you said to make sure of it. So I have an employee, he or she has contracted or I've suspected they've contracted, okay? As an employer, I have to be pretty confidential in that. You have to be, you have to be, unless if the employee, and most we're finding will, because they don't want to infect okay, others. I'm going to go down the path they don't. Okay. Okay. If they don't, as an employer, you have to take reasonable measures to protect their confidentiality. Okay. That's so, where I'm going. Right. So, so I'm protecting this individual's confidentiality, right. which I get it. Okay. If I got COVID, I don't know if I went to right. the world sure. to know. Sure. Right. Now. I get COVID, you sit by me, my employer doesn't let you know, and sure enough, two weeks later, you have it. What recourse do you have back on the employer for not making you aware? How's all that shake out? Well, you know, that's interesting. They're even trying to, uh, you know, pass some legislation to hold where employers are not liable. But as of now, what has to happen, because there is a liability on the employer and there is an expectation my employer is going to create an environment for me that is safe and that I don't have to worry about getting infected. It seems like the employer is in this rock and hard place. Well, but they are. But this is what you can do. You can stop short of saying, hey, by the way, I know you sit next to Dan and Dan has tested positive for COVID. Versus, but do what, you have to get? Do you have to get approval from that employee to share that? To share that it was Dan who's impacted. Okay. However, what I don't have to do is I have the ability as an employer to go to folks. Now, again, this is where you have to make you've got some good contract tracing in place to know who might have been exposed. This is why. The idea of limiting or maybe shutting down your common areas is a good idea because otherwise, how do you know? Yeah. This person who was tested positive for COVID could have went and used a coffee pot right before you did, or they could have used, you know, these things and you have no idea. So that's all these things you need to think through. But now I know because you can, re- I can still require you as an employee, if you get tested, to report the results back to us as the employer. We have the right to know Who's that. responsible for the, the financial side of the test? Or is the test free? The, the, most of the uh, insurance companies now will cover the cost of the test. Yeah, okay. so there's there's no financial, financial burden. burden on the employee, right. So, so what happens in that situation now 
the employee hasn't given us a, a voluntary disclosure to allow us to say it was Dan, that employer still has the ability and has the obligation to do the contract tracing, try to determine, okay, in this contact tracing, where is, I, I know Dan sits in this area. I know Dan's tested positive. I can talk to employees in that area and say, we have reason to believe that you may have been exposed uh, to the coronavirus and you need to go get tested, quarantine, whatever, whatever decisions made. I'm not sharing who it was okay. that might have exposed them. Now, doesn't take long for doesn't this. take long for them to figure <laughs> it out. Well, you, you know, know, Mary hasn't been in. Yeah, exactly. For, Where's for Mary at? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so, uh, so it's a bit of a fine line. Um, so, why would employers want to bring people back and be exposed to just all of that? And and again, I think this is just the old way of thinking. Yeah, it's that. Hey, I've started this business, as you mentioned earlier. I've started this business. I had these preconceived notions. I need to be in here. Uh, I think our employees are better when they can interact with each other, when they can see each other, they can share ideas. But, but as you, you said, lose it's really not an option. Though. It's not an option. You lose it anyway. You yeah. lose it anyway. And and those are valid. Mm -hmm. I understand why an employer would say that. You think about information that gets shared. You know, you're just working on something. You overhear someone talking about something and, you know, you can collaborate on it, have that information. You have to be very intentional with your communication if you're working remote. You know, you're going to have to make sure that you're setting up regular meetings, that you're, uh, we basically, what we're doing, we require all of our meetings to not only, we use Skype, not only to use Skype, but to use your video. And it just creates a little That's bit just more a engagement. That's company policy. It's our company adopted. policy. We and say, the reason listen. is what? Well, you know what we want? The idea of talking on the phone or just using the audio. I think you lose you lose that that as much human interaction as you can potentially Here's get. Here's a question for you. When you deployed, uh, when GMS deployed all the employees home, were they all equipped with cameras? They were. They uh, were. Yes. And this was, this had nothing to do with COVID. We really changed our technology strategy a few years so back. Laptops. Everyone works on laptops or Surface okay. with cameras. And, uh, you know, we had VPN hookups. So everyone was from a technology perspective, but most are not. Yeah. You know, employers out there are not able to do that. So we were fortunate that yeah. we, were, we were able to deploy the workforce very quickly. Yeah. And, um, and so that, you know, that worked out fine. So what are some things you think companies, HR need to be considering as we're bringing employees back? What would be some, I guess, so, things to do? So what we're seeing are some trends that are starting to emerge with companies. First one, of course, being remote work. We're going to see a lot more companies going to remote workforce. So what's HR need to do? What actions need to happen? we need to kind of redefine some of the skill sets that employees need to be a little bit more effective working from home. And that a lot of it is around kind of some digital dexterity, you know, technology use that maybe was not there prior. So from an HR perspective, how can we deploy and train and, and change that skill set a little bit that's going to allow a person to be a little bit more effective? Recruiting is going to change significantly if we go to a remote workforce or even a hybrid workforce. If you think about, you mentioned before retention and companies absolutely are going to, they're gonna lose employees if they're not gonna be flexible and adaptable what they're doing. But from an HR perspective, it opens up an entire new talent pool that we didn't have access to before. There's no geographic boundaries. No now. geographic boundaries. And we're seeing this particularly in the technology space. And we have surprisingly a lot of technology based type of companies here in Northeast Ohio. I mean, take a look at, um, you know, Highland Software, you know, in Cleveland. It's, it's like a, you know, dot com Silicon Valley type company. Yeah. One of their struggles has been 
is to attract talent, technology talent in this marketplace because it is limited. Well, if we take off the constraints of the person has to come into office, they have to live in Akron, Ohio, and now I can recruit technology folks from anywhere in the United States to work for my company. I've just opened up a, it's a tremendous advantage for companies. It'll be a tremendous disadvantage for those that don't adopt early. Yeah. Because they'll, an they'll interesting, get recruited away. An interesting topic on that subject <clears throat> is it, uh, what you're talking about is exactly true, right? No more boundaries. But the employee who lives in L.A., who makes $150,000 a year, $200,000 a year, that same role here in Ohio maybe pays $70,000. Yeah. So is that, is that talent really available to us? You know, it's, it's certainly going to, it's going to require companies to change their compensation practices. So if you think once about- once again, that's putting a lot of burden on the company. It is. It is. Let's look at the flip side of that. I work with a, uh, on a on board of an organization that has hundreds and hundreds of locations in the United States. Never believe these individuals can work remote. And suddenly overnight they were working remote. And they're finding that their revenue is up. Every, every one of our critical measures are positive right now. So what's happening when their leases are coming up in these locations across the United States, we're making decisions, not going to be renewing these leases. And because we don't need this space. Well, the amount of savings more than make up for additional dollars you may need to spend to bring in the talent. Or just shifting. You're just shifting dollars. You're shifting dollars. And let's face it, it comes down to our competitive advantage in any company it's the people. It's the people. It's the people. And if you could enhance, improve your skill set of your folks, higher level talented individuals, it's worth paying a little yeah. bit more money. Well, it's funny you mention that because uh, in a lot of the circles that, that I communicate in, that is a big topic right now is how do I better equip the people? How do I better train them? Right? Because now more than ever, I think we're really seeing people are the key. You know, yes. they're, they're kind of islands out there now. I mean, I can communicate with them and I can face their Zoom and see their face, right, but right. it's not like I'm there and I lost the whole culture. I lost the whole community, right? Now, you know, I know companies are trying to recreate a new culture and a new community virtual, right? right. And that's a whole right. new science and thing out there right now. But you're right. It's, it, it's companies got to figure out how to shift dollars to take care to take care people. of those things. Yep. They need to they need to to look at the management staff. The management team needs to be retooled because now managing certainly a remote workforce, a hybrid workforce is a different skill set. Totally different. And so now managers yeah. have to think about to the get people the who are set. very good people people. They got great presentation skills, people skills, they're charismatic. They may not be the best manager now. That's exactly right. And that just changes lots of things. It does, because now they have to use data analytics more. And that's maybe just that's what they hate. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so it really mm -hmm. forces companies to rethink, you know, what that workforce looks like, the type of managers they're going to have, you know, performance systems. Do we have to change how we evaluate people and measure folks? Because it's, it's all different. So where's HR fit in this? How's this? How's the role of HR adapt, change, whatever, grow, evolve, where they fit? So here's where I think they fit, Dan. And this is what's really interesting. Pre-COVID, we were already seeing a huge shift in HR. Well, let me say that differently. We're seeing a shift in what CEOs and business leaders were thinking HR needs to be and HR needs to do. So prior to this, CEOs were saying, you know, HR needs to move to be more broad gauged business folks that can really add value in any part of our organization. This is pre COVID. Pre COVID. Why pre -COVID. do you think that thought was going on? I think what was happening, it was about alignment. So let's think about what happens. HR, 
And this is my profession, and I'm not being critical of the profession, but this is just what my reality is. We have, I refer to it as the HR echo chamber. HR professionals, we talk to each other. We talk to other talent acquisition professionals. We talk to the other, um, you know, comp specialists. We talk to all these folks within our own discipline and our own profession. You That's don't, where you don't we, get out to the people you need to talk to. Exactly. We're not spending time and talking to the customers, to the business leaders, to the CEOs, to the very stakeholders. On our job is to support them is to help drive business results and, and, and help the business line leaders. And we spend all of our time talking with each other. There are, in Northeast Ohio alone, there are tons and tons of HR groups. And there's meetings and there's seminars and we get together and we talk about all these HR things. Oh, I've got this program. I got this engagement program. I'm doing this and doing that. And we get to be so disconnected from what's going on in the business. So why do you think the CEOs, okay, the, the owners, the CEOs, why were they putting that responsibility on HR? Why were they saying HR needs to be? They, they were doing it because they realized HR is basically responsible for the human capital plan of an organization. And... CEOs are realizing, as we just talked about, the competitive advantage they're going to have. Technology process advantages are short-lived, as we know, right? I can come up with a great product. I can come up with a, a really cool technology, and it's replicated very quickly. And so whatever competitive advantage I had there... The market can catch it. Catch it very fast, very quickly. But the competitive advantage long-term is always going to be the employees. And I think CEOs now have really understood that. I kind of get this HR thing more than I did, but I need an HR person that understands my business. Mm -hmm. That's the other piece, Dan, that I am really seeing that we as a profession have not done a good job of really understanding how the business Does operates. Does HR want to do that? Most of the time, the answer is no. But what they do want, we've heard for years, HR says, I want to be a partner to the business. I mean, I've heard this forever. I want a seat at the table. You know, other directors, other VPs are at the table, and I'm not. You know, why is that? How come I am left out? We even went as far, and I, I find this comical, if you would think back in the day, HR generalist. Everyone had an HR generalist, you know, in their company. HR generalist job title kind of disappeared, not because the companies did it. The HR profession came up with this HR business partner title. So you look at most organizations, now they're HR business partners. And sometimes I joke, that's as close as we got in a profession to being a partner is we changed our job title to say, hey, we're going to partner, you know, you with CEO, with you, the business line leader. But, you know, a partnership requires risk. We have to assume risk. We have to assume risk in what's going on with the business. The idea to say, hey, I want a seat at the table. I want to be a partner. That then tells me is if you want that, you better understand how that product's made. What's our distribution strategies? What's going on with our customers? What are the challenges with the customers? How are we viewed in the market? What's going on in the production line? You know, why or how can we can't get our products out on time? What's our distribution logistic issues? What's going on? HR, in order to truly add value, that's where the HR needs to shift the focus to. Well, you know, you you meant you kick, you kicked the show off with uh, one of your previous positions. Uh, it wasn't HR; it was personnel, right? Okay, and I I agree a lot with what you're saying, and I think HR has become, or I shouldn't say has become, has often taken on the role of personnel. Exactly. Right. We right. we we respond to. Jim's not here today again. Mary's not here. Okay, we'll go meet with them. Hey, I need to hire some, get some paperwork put together. And they become a facilitator. 
right? And exactly. It's, and it's needed. It's needed. It's, it's critical. It's, it's critical. important. Yep. Yeah. It's got to be important. Yeah. Things got to be documented correctly. Absolutely. It's needed. But I think that has kind of, that's kind of where it, it landed. And what you're talking about is you're talking about evolving that to a whole new level. It and, is a whole new level. And, and the thing that's going through my mind is I'm not sure a lot of the HR people that are in that role are the same people to rise to that level. I don't, I don't know that. Yeah. That, that, you know, that's a great point. You know, it's interesting. When I look at when I was running large HR departments and even my HR consulting practice, when I needed to bring on a person to work in HR or work in my HR consulting practice, I would never hire someone that worked nothing but an HR background. If they worked only in the HR field and had spent no time out on the line, had spent no time working in the business, I would not bring that person on. I thought it was critical that the person had that business acumen, that they understood how to read a financial statement, a cash flow statement, balance sheets, that they understand production schedules. Those things to me were critical. My, my former partner in the, in the consulting business always used to joke um, about, he goes, you know, we can teach him HR. And he would follow that with, you know, Mark, if you and I can learn it, anybody can. So uh, now HR can be very complex, can be very technical, and it's not, it's not that easy to learn. Yeah. There's but a the, lot of what ifs. In there, there is. There's a lot going on. It's a tough profession to be in. And, and HR professionals have a very tough job. You know, I, I would always tell our HR managers, you have, you, your job's a dual role. Your job is to protect the employee and your job is to protect the employer. Exactly. And you have to sit in the middle of that and make decisions. If you see one getting out of balance, you have to jump in there. That's right. And it's a tough balancing act. You know, trying to be an advocate advocate for the employee at the same time. Well, and and they the also the they, they, they often get accused, right? A lot. Yeah, they do. Why don't you see my side? Exactly. Why aren't you? Oh, you're just siding with the company. That's right. Okay. And if they side over here with the employer, the company's going. What do you mean? Exactly. I exactly. Get it, rid of them. Well, you see what they did. Well, yeah, but it, we got to follow this policy. They're in a tough situation. That, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. But I, I will share, if you have a strong HR person, that person who can stand up to the company and stand up to the employee and stand firm, very valuable. Extremely valuable. Extremely valuable. Because as an employer, you begin, you even though you may not see eye to eye all the time, you do know. I can value their input. Exactly. You're, you're Even getting, if I don't agree with it, that's I, right. I'm valuing with it, and they're going to stand up to me. That's right. And sometimes you need to be stood up to. You do. You do. That takes a lot of courage. Companies aren't always correct. That's right. That's right. It's hard though. HR is in a very difficult position in that. You know, to have that courage, to you know, to have that environment and that relationship. But think about Dan that ability to stand up, to have that courage to say to the employer, you know, you're wrong. you're wrong in this. And here's why your credibility and well, you better it, be right when you say, well, that. you better be right when you say, it. but <laughs> the other thing you better be is that if my CEO knows that I understand what's going on on the line floor, mm -hmm. I know what that employee's job is. I know what's going on with our company and how our business works my credibility is much higher. So when I push back or I challenge something that's going on with the employer, I'm not doing it from this kind of, you know, warm and fuzzy traditional HR perspective. I understand how the impact that it has on the company, it has on our customers, it has on our bottom line. And, you know, looking at it from a more holistic perspective. Sure. That's why it's sure. so critical to, to do that. But, and when you, know, you talked about HR, do they want to do this? I think HR does. The skill set might need to be retold a bit, you know, to be able to understand more of the business side of things. A lot of HR folks now have much greater analytical skills than they had before. 
and can do things that, you know, quite frankly, back when I started in personnel, it was very transactional driven. Some companies are still that way, depending on the size of your company and the sophistication, you're still seeing that. But the importance of the business side in HR comes to alignment. And are you aligning your human capital programs and plans with the company's business strategies, the business and operational plans? I give you a, just a great real life example. I was talking here recently with uh, a senior level team at a large company in town. And this is an organization, it's an international company, you know, 50,000 employees, and they were working on succession planning. And the chief HR officer, the CEO, both commented that you know, our succession plan, I like, is very good. I like it's working. Well, that's not surprising in that you find about 14% of succession plans work. And um, at the core, succession planning is planning for the future. But take a look at the way a succession plan is developed. You've seen it, you know, in organizations all the time. You develop a high potential list. You know, you use all the traditional tools, a nine buck matrix. I look at performance and I look at potential. And I'm looking at, I've got a group of executives I need to, you know, potentially are going to be retiring in two years, five years. I need to build their successors out. Here was a case. So, so HR this company did all the traditional things and on paper it looked really good. What was missing was this organization was undergoing a major strategic shift in their business. They were moving from a traditional brick and mortar kind of marketing, traditional marketing style and method to an omni-channel, e-commerce, digital, totally different but platform they didn't align their personnel. Yes, and but the personnel, all the succession planning was aligned to replacing jobs that existed today. When I went and talked with them, I looked at it, and I said, you know what, the jobs that you need to plan for don't exist in your organization today. And so your whole succession plan is flawed. And but here's a case with HR would have been more actively involved in the strategy of the business, in how the business work, in the challenges and all the changes that were going on, they would have had the ability to not only change the succession planning model, but everything attached to it. Yeah. Think about your talent acquisition model. You know, it has to change. I have to hire a totally different person than what I hired two months ago because the skill set's different. So what can a company do to start moving that direction, to get HR to that level that they want? I think the first thing they need to do is they do need to get HR actually involved in that strategic and business planning process. So let's not develop our strategies and our plans and, and you know what's going on in the business and then let's go to HR and say, build out your capital, human capital plan to align with this. They need to be brought in much sooner. I think the other thing they need to do is I would start taking some of my best leaders that are in the line of business, and I would rotate them, move some of those individuals into HR. Some of the, the managers. Yes, I find it easier, quite frankly, to, we can, we can really teach. That's an interesting. It is, because what we can do is we can develop, yeah. I think we can develop the HR yeah. skill set sometimes maybe easier than we can the business skill set. Well, and I think the key is you're talking about managers who have been dealing with personnel. Exactly. Right? They exactly. know. They understand. They understand the challenges. They understand the challenges. So right. now when I got to manage these challenges with these practices, or I got to implement these policies, they're, they're in tune to that. Exactly. So Interesting the flip, point. So the flip side you can do with that, the other option you have 
is to, to take your HR leaders and have them spend time and rotations working in the business. And think about now, if I am managing a support function and suddenly you toss me into a P&L center where I have to manage the day-to-day issues that goes on with these employees, uh, with the operations of the business, it gives HR a totally different perspective. Sure. And now when they're back into their HR role, they get a much greater appreciation with what that, yeah. that line manager is dealing with. And so I, I think you can go either direction sure. on this, but there needs to be a kind of that cross yeah. pollinization or cross functional work. If I'm an HR professional, what should I do to start positioning myself to be more in line with what you're saying? There's two things I would do. One, I would just immerse myself in the business. Just start doing it. I would start doing it. I would spend time with my best leaders and managers and understand what is really going on in the business. What are the strategies? What are the challenges? What's what's the future bringing? Where are you focusing your time and energy? I am going to learn everything I can about that. You know, Dan, it was years and years ago, and I, and I, and I like to tell this story because it was, it's somewhat fascinating. When I started my consulting practice, I had an opportunity to meet with a business owner. One of the accounting partners said, I want you to meet with this guy, but he's not interested in anything you do in your HR services. So I just want to let you know that. But out of a courtesy, I'll make the introduction. Okay, great. And um, so this business owner is about 15, 20 minutes late showing up for lunch. He shows up, he comes in, and he just starts dumping on what was going on in his plant. And he is just livid. This is happening, this is happening, and whatever. So I'm asking him questions about his, his assembly line. They made industrial knives. I'm asking him all these questions. So we're about 20 minutes into that. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, I apologize. He said, I come in here and I'm just complaining about all this stuff and whatever. I thought I was meeting this HR consulting guy that I really didn't want to meet with. Um, so tell me what you do. I'm an HR consultant. Guy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so it was, it was really interesting. I said, I help companies drive business results. And he said, well, that's really fascinating. He goes, you know, I love what you're saying. You're asking me these questions and what have you. And can you come in and meet with me and my other two partners tomorrow? Went in the next day, met with his partners, and they signed, signed me on the spot to do retained HR management for them. They wanted nothing to do with the HR consulting yeah. guy. And um, and we didn't talk about anything HR. You approached it different. Approached it totally different. I was just trying to find out, hey, what's going on with, with your, why can't you get this product out the door? Yeah. So if the HR folks could immerse themselves in Good advice. these things, it's going to help the other things that needs to happen. If you think about in running your business, I suspect if I went out and looked around here, You've got scorecards, you have dashboards, you have metrics. You can tell me all the different things that's going on with KPIs, what's going on in your business. And you know, you know your revenue per employee, you've got all this data. HR, we tend to track transactions. And we track things that can tell you what was happening. The other thing I would say for HR professionals, what you want to do is to start measuring things that matter, that are related to business outcomes, things that will help you understand why it's happening and measures that will allow you to predict what is going to happen. This idea of measuring what happened is an old school way of doing things. But if I look at HR metrics today, 95% 95% of companies in our HR metrics kind of tell me what was happening. That's not particularly valuable to the business. HR needs to be looking out the front window instead of the rear view mirror. Exactly right. Exactly right. And <clears throat> so it's a whole different way of looking. It's a, it's a top-down approach, a developing yeah. measures versus a <clears throat> bottoms up. And now you have limitations. Some companies, you know, you don't have the right systems in place and, you know, things to collect the data that you need. 
But spending that time with the business, you understand what really matters and you can start developing your measures and your KPIs around that. There's some great tools now, um, HR systems that have some predictive analytics, that have some AI yep. that are really game changers. Yep. So those are things I would do if, you know, if I'm sitting, I'm on the, uh, yep. as my good friend uh, likes to say, I'm on the, uh, I'm on the bell lap of my career. And uh, which is uh, a little frightening to, to think about. Uh, so, you know, for young HR folks coming in, yeah. I think if they can really focus on those, because I would argue there may not be a more important position than HR going forward. Oh, I agree. I agree. But I want to point out one thing. I'm, on, I'm probably on that same bell lap. We may be yeah. running parallel to one another. Yeah, exactly. I actually might be carrying the same baton. Right. There is something I think we have to point out. The thing, the advice you gave, I think was awesome. Here's the thing, though. The advice you gave, it requires the individual to take a step. It does. Right? It does. You can't set back. That HR person can't set back and expect, require, or demand that the employer is going to handhold them through everything. They too have to take a step themselves. They do. And I think that's important. That's important to point out, right? Yes. You, you have I me mean, cuz some of the things you're saying that's hard. Right? Hey, yeah, very hard. Get out in front of the the business units. Go immerse yourself. Right? You don't need to go to the president and say I'm going to do Start, Just do it. Start doing it. Exactly. Start creating value. Start creating value today that wasn't there yesterday. So, so the president is going, whoa, did you see what Mary's been doing? You see what man, Jim's been bringing some in. So I want to point that out because I think it's critical. People still have, you know, we, we talked about people are the key and they are. They're, they're the key. And so we have to take a step. As people, we have to take that step ourselves. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and it's hard to do. It's hard. You know, because we're getting out of our comfort zone now. Yep. You're not you know, going to make any more money today, no, tomorrow for doing no, that. No. You're going to work harder. You're going to work longer. It, exactly. Exactly. But you know what you're going to have is your the, the fulfillment, that ability to now you're really going to engage yep. and connect people to the yep. business. And your value down the road. is much higher. It's going much higher than it was. And And, you know, the other thing is that there's a bit of a survival to this as well because the business leaders are demanding so much more from that HR suite than they did before. Yep. And they expect us And it's going to continue to, do this. to increase. It, it will continue. Probably more so now post-COVID. No doubt. Uh, companies, we're seeing companies right now being very innovative, coming up with new ideas and new products and things, really agile. They're resilient uh, you know, they're building processes and things around, you know, prior to COVID, there was so much focus on re-engineering for efficiencies. Now companies are looking at resilience because you know what we're finding? There are companies that this lean model that they went to is not particularly resilient and the processes break down in this pandemic it created some some challenges. Yeah. Some red flags. Some red flags. HR can help redefine critical skill sets. And it's about criticality versus designing things around roles. It's, re, it's designing around critical skills. Yeah. And that's a whole no shift because we've always designed things around our workforce planning around roles. That's changing. Yeah. That's changing. And Someone shared a, a quote with me uh, just recently. And the quote was, a year from now, we should be embarrassed by what we didn't know last year. I think that's a great quote. Great quote, isn't it? It is. It right? is. And I think, you know, if you, if you stop and think about that, a year from now, we should be embarrassed by what we did not know a year ago. I mean, it's saying, hey... You, you should constantly be striving to be better. Exactly. To know more, and that requires you to take a step. It does. It does. There's never been a better time. Oh, gosh. This is opportune be in, time. I mean, it, for an HR professional, this is the best this time is it. 
rather than looking at this and is what's going on with the pandemic, yeah. it is providing so many opportunities. It's giving us that opportunity. You know, we had said we want a seat at the table. Well, that seat is front and center right now. No doubt. It's there. No doubt. We need to we need to step into it. Yep. We need to do it. But you said yep. it's going to take action. Yeah. On our part. Well, hey, I uh, I appreciate you coming. It's been a. It's obvious you've been in the business for a long time, and I thought you had some great, um, some great insight and some great advice, some great suggestions, some great steps that both the employer can take and both the HR professional can take. And so I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks and for having me, Dan. If somebody wanted to reach out to you or GMS, how do they reach you? Well, my email is HR Partners dot white at gmail.com hrpartners.white at gmail.com that's the best way to reach me very good very good well hey thanks for coming in thanks for having I me Dan. Appreciate it. yep my pleasure hey thanks for tuning in interesting show today there are a lot of takeaways from today's show lots of takeaways and so appreciate mark coming in if you like shows like this hit subscribe we'd like you to follow us we'd like to see you hear from you if there's shows, more shows like this, or if there's certain shows you would like to see, reach out to me, dharsh at danharsh.com. Would love to hear from you. Would love to bring some of those shows on. So stay in touch. Thanks for tuning in today. Talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.